DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, a religious community dedicated to retreats and spiritual formation according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He is featured on several series found on the Eternal Word television network. He is also author of numerous books on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, all published by the Crossroads Publishing Company. This particular series is based in part on Chapter 4 of Setting Captives Free, Personal Reflections on Ignatian Discernment of Spirits. Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Thank you so much for helping us to have this clarification between the two, because as I was listening to you, it seems as though in that dark night, because it is an aspect of prayer in relationship with God, his presence is there in the life of that particular person. Mother Teresa may not have had extraordinary experiences, but there's a sense of God. There's a, an awareness. That she kept doing the spiritual practice. She kept going to Mass. She kept doing the works of love. And as you described, there, in desolation, there's a desire not to do any of that. You're being called to, to change patterns, to turn away. And there's a lack of hope. So that the response in either case is exactly the contrary, because the two experiences are from contrary sources. So as you say, Mother Teresa, faithfully, she's a beautiful witness to accepting God's work, in this case, the dark night, and the fruitfulness of it. Would you say that the experience of Ignatius, for example, when he had that initial prompting and consolation to become a Dominican or to become a Franciscan, and the desire to want to become like the saints he was reading, but then found in those moments as he grew closer that that wasn't his calling. I mean, that he was in an area where he was maybe confused about how he was supposed to respond in that quest. That That's not desolation. No, that would not be an experience of desolation. In fact, the fact that the delight was there not only when he thought about this, living like the saints, but even afterwards, that was his initial That's when his eyes were opened a little to begin to realize that the enduring quality of happiness that he felt was a sign of where God was leading him. So, no, that's not an experience of spiritual desolation. What you actually have there is a man who, for the first time, is in a personal way discovering the spiritual life as it really can be and what heroic holiness can mean. This is a man who has always wanted the heroic dimension you know, to be the the great knight and the deeds of chivalry and the romantic exploits and glory in the world. What's happening is that he's discovering now for the first time, because his convalescence, the long convalescence, is allowing him to absorb this through the reading, that there is another way to be heroic. And that these men like Francis and Dominic and the others did incredibly heroic things for God. And what he homes in on actually is the austerities. So he's very new to this. He doesn't have much training at all in the spiritual life. All that this energetic man of 30 who wants to do great things is aware of is that these saints did heroic penances. And if they did it, why couldn't I? Why shouldn't I do it? So it's a very basic level of the spiritual life, understandably at this point. And in fact, when he does go to Manresa, when his leg is well enough so he can go there, he sets out to imitate these austerity, uh, austerities of the saints, and he does it uh, to a, a rather uh, almost uh, uh, unsettling degree, and in fact did harm his health in some ways that he would carry for the rest of his life, but with the help of a confessor found a better, a better balance. So what we have there is someone who is discovering the spiritual life for the first time, has no real background. For him at this point, heroic holiness means these saints did these heroic penances. I need to to do the same heroic penances that they did. But rapidly, he's going to grow beyond that as he gets uh, so close to the Lord. 
So no, that's not an experience of spiritual desolation at all, but an initial step in the spiritual life. Now, you know, Ignatius is the master of discernment, but he obviously didn't begin this way. On that journey from Loyola, when he leaves his home toward Montserrat and Manresa, at one point he encounters a Muslim and they're riding together and they have a conversation and in the conversation, Our Lady comes up and the Muslim says some things with with no bad will at all, but just out of his own background about Our Lady that Ignatius cannot accept, you know, from our Catholic understanding of Our Lady. And this is his lady and he has to uphold the honor of his lady. And the Muslim at a certain point turns off to where he's going and Ignatius now uh, is in a quandary. Should I, and you'll see the very uh, initial level of his spiritual journey at this point, what do I do here? Uh, Our Lady's honor has been besmirched in some way. Can I simply let this man go or do I need to pursue him and kill him, put him to death for what he said? Unsure of what to do, what Ignatius does is that he allows so discernment. Ignatius uh, reaches the fork in the road at which he will either continue his own journey or go off to follow the Muslim and put him to death to uphold Our Lady's honor and allows the the mule to make the choice. And the mule, fortunately, (laughs) in God's providence, chooses uh, the road which has him simply continue his journey. Now, I quote that just to point out that Ignatius did not start out as a master of discernment. He had amazing light from the moment of his conversion on his convalescent bed. His eyes are opened a little. He's introduced into the whole world of discernment. But growth in this was a journey for him as well. So the question that you raise really highlights the fact that we're witnessing Ignatius at a very grace-filled but very initial step in the spiritual life. And the reason I think that jumped out at me, because I think many people, and I know myself, as you're growing and fully um, on the spiritual journey, or you're, you're moving on the sp- spiritual journey, that you believe you're supposed to be going down a certain path, or you're engaged in it, you feel God has called you to do something, and you begin to hit those roadblocks, or there seems to be some frustration and you become confused. You become, am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? And you, you get frustrated, and sometimes you can even get depressed. And in those types of moments, it can be so discouraging that, you know, it affects the prayer. And people think, it may say, well, maybe you're in a dark night, or you're, maybe this is a period of desolation, when it actually you're, you're, there's just confusion about what you are experiencing. I mean, the, that I think is a, is people, you, you come into the church, you're all excited, you receive all these graces, and then you, you want to do all that, and they become confused. And then maybe a little bit of depression s- sets in because they're not sure. And then they hear terms like dark night, and they hear terms like in spiritual desolation. And that's why the, the wise counsel is so important. Yes, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with not seeing yet clearly what the Lord is asking. Certainly, we're always called to be doing our part to grow toward clarity in, and actively doing so, not not just passively waiting, which would not be the case in, in, in people that you're describing here. People of very good will who want to do the Lord's will and just aren't sure that they found it yet. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. What's important is to be on the journey of discernment. And that would be, in terms of our conversations, that whole set of conversations that we did earlier on Ignatius's teaching on how to discern God's will in the various choices that we face. So I'd like to refer anyone who might find him or herself reflected in what you've just described to those conversations. It's a wonderful thing to know that our tradition, and Ignatius is not the only but the prime exponent of it in this, has a wisdom for us that there is a journey toward clarity in discerning God's will, that there are steps we can take, that there are spiritual means that we can can employ, that there are ways of recognizing God's response. So I'd, I'd like to refer anyone in that situation to that teaching, which I think, together with so many in the church, that he or she would find, I think, pretty helpful. It's so comforting to know 
that there is a way to deal with discerning God's will in choices that we face. It's the difference between time passing and the, the heavy sensation that I don't seem to be moving forward with this at all, kind of like I'm spinning in place. The difference between that, so not knowing but feeling that nothing is really moving, and not knowing but knowing that I'm on a journey, that I'm employing the means and things are moving forward. Even though we don't yet have clarity in that second case, there's so much more hope and peace now because we know that we are journeying wisely toward that. We'll return to Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Maurizio Sfildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages, can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today. The Councils of Mercy, an excerpt from the writings of Venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. Above all, I recommend with all my heart that you guard against discouragement, disturbance, and sadness. Seek always to keep your poor heart in peace and encourage it, and always to serve God with holy joy. Be of good heart, because the Lord is with you, and he loves you. For more excerpts from the writings of Venerable Bruno Lanteri, visit discerninghearts.com. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. Is doubt an aspect of the dark night or is that desolation? I'm doubting your existence, God. Because when you see Mother Teresa, I, I wonder if she was in a dark night. If It doesn't seem as though she ever had a doubt. She always trusted I will let's pray. Let's let's keep going. Believe and, and and miracles happened every day in her encounters with people through that love. But is doubt an aspect of either of those? Well, like so many things in the spiritual life, three different people could say I have doubts, and it could mean three very different things. So there's always an individual level to look at in this. One person might say, I have doubts about the existence of God and say this in very good faith, with very good will, maybe was never given any faith earlier in life or through whatever circumstances at, at a certain point, lost any sense of faith in God, but a good person sincerely seeking the truth and who is open to learn and maybe on a journey pursuing that truth. In so many conversion stories, you see that so beautifully, people that don't know 
that do have doubts, but don't just stay there. They're reading, they're consulting, they're praying, they're exploring until the God who promises, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, gives the grace and the doubts are resolved. Those kinds of doubts, I would say, are different from the real, true and beautiful experience of faith, but which is still without vision. We walk by faith and not by sight, Paul says. So their faith of its very nature means a, a yes, a trust in what we do not see. So that, that dimension will always be there in faith. That's not doubting. That's simply living the life of faith. So that's different from the kind of doubt that I just described. Another experience of doubt would be, uh, well, let's keep using the example of the woman in the 10 minutes of prayer. And let's say she does call her friend and she does begin the prayer and she loves it. She can see the fruits, weeks and some number of months have gone by, and she loves what's happening. But recently, the last week or so, it's been kind of a struggle. Uh, She hasn't really felt at the end of the prayer like much has really happened. And now she begins to, to doubt whether her prayer is really genuine, whether she's really growing, and there's a heaviness and a discouragement with this. Yes, that's very much an experience of spiritual desolation. That's the enemy at work. Be aware, understand, and take action to reject. And then I want to reverence the deeper level of the dark night. And I don't want to speak uh, too analytically, you know, or abstractly or speculatively of it. I would imagine that experiences of doubt could come in and out of this. Doubt about uh, where I stand in my relationship with God. I used to feel such warmth in prayer and such closeness and communion with with the Lord in prayer. Now my prayer is is dry, it's arid, it's even painful. Am I going backwards in the spiritual life? Am I regressing? Uh, Is something wrong? These kinds of doubts can very much be a part of the experience of the dark night. And that's why why spiritual direction is so important in the time of spirit of uh, the dark night. And when the director is able to identify the experience as the dark night in John's sense, then what the director will do is encourage the person as the person goes through this. So like so many things in the spiritual life, a single word can mean very many different things. And there we've just looked at some of the experiences. You know, I've heard it said, Father Gallagher, that John of the Cross, particularly this teaching, was designed primarily for spiritual directors, for those Carmelite priests who would be guiding those souls that were coming into this uh, reformed order of the Carmelites. So in, a, in some ways, our understandings of it, just as you've just broken it open, and it, it takes a little bit more than just claiming the words dark night, because we can make it seem something that it isn't. You know, it, sometimes we confuse depression. We can c- confuse, as we've just spoken, frustration and many other things with it. And that's not what it's about. No, so those that's why these distinctions that we're making now are important, and that's why, in part why I wanted this new book, because there's a, a further body of understanding about Ignatius's rules that I wanted to get out, as I said earlier, into the conversation. So depression is a non-spiritual desolation. Spiritual desolation is the garden variety tactic of the enemy. Garden variety in the sense that we all experience it just discouragement in the spiritual life. And then the dark night is a beautiful work of God that comes at a certain stage in the spiritual life. So this leads to a final question to raise, which is a practical question. Now, having made the distinction between spiritual desolation and the dark night, what do we do in practice with regard to this? How do we navigate this in our own experience in the spiritual life? Just a few general things, because as I've said other uh, other times, the individual level of an individual's experience finally has to be looked at in an individual one-on-one setting. But we can say some general things about this. The first is that we all experience spiritual desolation. I've been teaching these rules for like, probably about 35 years now to all kinds of audiences. And so we look at spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation. I've never yet had one person say to me, I don't know what you're talking about. Everyone does. This is ordinary 
spiritual experience. It's the stuff of the spiritual life. There's no shame in experiencing spiritual desolation. What's necessary is be aware, understand, take action. All that we've been saying. Not everyone has experienced or has yet experienced the dark night. And that's the reason in part why this is uh, gets unclear for us because when we speak about spiritual desolation, everyone knows exactly what that means once it's described. It may be harder for us to to know in concrete experiential terms what the dark night uh, looks like because we may not have experienced it. So that, that's just one difference. What that says is I don't think we should be too quick to name an experience that we have in the spiritual life as the dark night. It might be but I don't think we too quickly get there. We need a little bit of clarity uh, and maybe some guidance in that. When does a person experience the dark night in John of the Cross's sense? Well, as we've just said, that comes at a specific point along the spiritual journey, and that is the transition from the more active forms of prayer to now the more passive and receptive and infused contemplation that John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila describe. So it comes at a specific point in the spiritual life so that those whom God is now calling on that journey, we don't call ourselves to it. Uh, We receive it if God chooses to give it. And if God does choose to give it, then at that point in, in whatever individual circumstances this will take in a person's life, God will invite the person to go through the dark night so as to be capable of the deeper union that follows. And then finally, I would say generally, and I have to say generally because we can't box the Holy Spirit. Look at Ignatius, 30 years of essentially pretty wayward life, has a conversion and within a few months is experiencing mystical. And in a few months, it has mystical experiences on a level with John of the Cross and Francis of Assisi. Uh, or look at people like St. Benedict Labre and so on, a street person essentially, and a saint, mentally probably pretty weak in various ways, with various disabilities, but a vessel that received God's love in a heroic way. So it, I don't want to ever put absolutes on any of this, but I would say probably generally what we will see in a person whom God is calling to the dark night is a certain generosity with the Lord, a certain depth of prayer, dedication to one's vocation, maybe some years of of living in this way, and then prayer gradually becomes simplified as the person grows closer to God. But I say that uh, with an asterisk, because as I say, um, God's grace can work in any situation and in any human situation that we may experience. You know, it's it's compelling that you would use that example because I'm reminded of something I've heard about the fruitfulness that will come from a life that is, you know, on the spiritual journey. That when you think of how a plant brings forth fruit, it's a natural experience, outgrowth that you can't make happen. It's something that it is born from the health and the growth of the plant. And from that, fruit is brought forward. We can cultivate it. We can try to give it all the nutrients and the care and plant it in the proper spot. And, but we can't make it grow fruit. Prayer is always a grace and a gift. So exactly, you know, that's exactly right. If we use Ignatius' own vocabulary on this point, God is the protagonist in prayer. That's uh, St. John Paul II's vocabulary. But we also have a part. So the divine person has a part and the human person also has a part in prayer. And obviously, by far the greater part is what the protagonist, what God does. Prayer is completely a gift and a grace from God. But we also do have a part, and Ignatius' word for that is our part is to dispose ourselves to receive that grace. So that's the active part. That's why we set aside time for prayer. Please God daily, have a a faithful life of the sacraments, all the practices of the spiritual life, spiritual reading, and all all the different things that help us. And then in, in John of the Cross's vocabulary, that's the active dark night of sense and of spirit. There is, even though that's only a sliver on the pie chart, God does ask that of us. So there is our part, 
but above all, essentially, all of this is gift and grace. So that our part is to be faithful to the spiritual life and then to receive, to let the Lord lead and receive wherever the Lord will lead us. And this will be very different in different people's lives. And it's beautiful. Uh, since we're quoting saints, you know how St. Therese faces this question of the different kinds of saints and answers it with the different kinds of flowers. You know, there are the strikingly beautiful flowers, and then there are the humbler uh, flowers. But it's in the tapestry of all of these together that beauty emerges. And she sees that as an image of how God works in different souls. Remember how she quotes her sister Pauline when Therese is still a very young girl. And she's, this question has come up. And uh, Pauline has her get a glass and then a thimble, and fill both with water, and then ask which is more full. We're, we're, we're all just very different, and God works individually, in, uh, as he will with each one. Our part is simply to be as faithful as we can, and then just trust that the Lord leads by the right paths, as the psalm says. So there's no there's no pressure, there's no anxiety, there's no... I should be here, you know, these kinds of things. Our, our part is simply to do our part and then to allow the Lord to lead. That's a first issue, the dark night and spiritual desolation. You've been listening to Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, take action with Father Timothy Gallagher. This particular series is based in part on Chapter 4 of Setting Captives Free. Personal Reflections on Ignatian Discernment of Spirits. You can find this book on Father Gallagher's website at fathertimothygallagher.org. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Spiritual Desolation. Be aware, understand, and take action with Father Timothy Gallagher.